Welcome to season two of the Small Town Big Dreams podcast. Hi, I'm Becky Waples, and this is the podcast that celebrates small town creators and shares their stories. Each week, we dive into each creator's journey, from their background to where they found their courage, from their challenges to their wins, where they found their inspiration to how they took their first step. I cannot wait to chat, laugh, and inspire the next small town creator with each of my guests. If you are inspired by small town creators who turn their big dreams into reality, then this is the podcast for you. Please rate and subscribe to all upcoming episodes. Please follow on Instagram and Facebook and always feel free to leave a message or comment to let me know what you'd like to hear or who you'd like to hear from. This little passion project is turning into quite the adventure and I'm so glad you've come along for the ride. Thank you from the bottom of this small town creator's big heart. Let's grow together. Yeah, we've talked a lot already. It's been... We should have been recording this whole time. I've been here for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. But it's been good. And we talked about everything. We're wearing the same outfit. <laughs> We're in a new setup. We're in the, it was kind of Oprah, but now it's more like sleepover y setup. Yes. Yeah. It reminds me of like, um, like all the podcast clips I see on TikTok where they're just like literally hanging out on the couch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. If we were going to record any of them, this one would have been a good this one. This is a good one. I didn't clean my house enough to do that one. But um, let's go. So good morning and thank you for listening to the Small Towns Big Dreams podcast. Today, how do I pronounce your name? Kinga. But your last name? Jacob. Jacob. Okay. Yeah. I was like, Jacob. No. So Kinga yeah. Jacob. I just westernized it like crazy because oh, it's Hungarian. Did... Yeah, it's Hungarian, but nobody can pronounce it. So I'm just like, well, I'm just a Canadian person now and I go by Jacob. Does it, like your dad call it Jacob? Or does no. He... Oh, God, no. Okay. It. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, I just, you know, when you're a kid, you just want to blend. Yeah. Yeah. So like, that's I guess, true. guess my last name is Jacob now. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, I was about to ask you, and then I was like, we, oh, we should start recording. Um, where are you from? Toronto. And when did you move to Toronto? Um, in 1988, in okay. the middle of a recession. <laughs> okay. From? <laughs> Romania. Really? Yeah. But I'm Hungarian. Okay. So there's a bit of an identity crisis yeah. there, but it's actually like very common for Hungarians to be in Romania. There was like a hostile takeover. And so okay. uh, Romania expanded and the surrounding countries got smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm actually from Transylvania, which really? when I was little, I never told anybody. Oh, right. Bullying. Vampires. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have thought that was actually really cool. Yeah, I know. It is yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So like my my region is Transylvania and just like a city in Transylvania. So why did why did your parents move here? Um, there was like a bit of a communist situation. There was, you know, like a dictatorship and they were like they have these crazy stories of like standing in line, you know, for like eight hours for like two potatoes oh. and just like all that stuff. So they're and I my dad has this version of the story where he's like a bit of a loudmouth, which I think is where I get it from. But um, I guess you're never supposed to say anything bad about the government. And he was. And mm. he's like, people were telling me that like the government was going to come after me. So he and my mom came up with this like elaborate secret plan. And he just like dipped in the middle of the night and hopped on a train with nothing. Went to like a refugee house in Vienna, Austria, which okay. is like a three hour train ride away from where we were in Romania and uh, and then applied for like um, immigration into Canada. Okay. Yeah. So our family was apart for about two years and then he moved to Toronto, lived there, kind of got us like a space and got a job and whatever. And then my mom, my sister and I came out in 1988 in the middle of a recession. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a cool story. I it's mean, pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's also like you, he could write a book. I feel like he could write. Oh my God. That man's stories are wild. Yeah. Even like his journey out of the country, like the people he met along the way and like the secret like um hookups he <laughs> had to like prearrange so he could like, you know, sleep at his buddy's grandma's house for the night and then switch you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then like the other people escaping the country at the same time. It's like so cool. It is very cool. Yeah. I know. My um, mom is from England and uh, my granddad moved to England or moved to Canada like a year before the rest of the family moved. Yeah. And I thought that was crazy because my Nana would have had six kids. Yeah. Uh, like 12 to two. And my granddad was like, don't worry, settling a life in Canada. Yeah. It'll be great. I promise. Yeah. Just hang tight. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just like, <laughs> um, okay. So Kinga, thank you for joining me. I've already said that, but what we came here today, I want to know about you and I want to know why you're here and I want to know about your business. So wherever you want to get started. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm here because you invited me. Yeah. Maybe the better question is why did you That's actually a good invite me. I kinda I kinda touched base on it. But okay, so when I quit my job, I was like, I'm gonna be a businesswoman. And I went to my first W boss and it was in September and I didn't know anybody there. And the the I can't remember her name out, but she was very nice to me. And she's like, W boss ones are so good. Last time there was a girl here and she was a sobriety coach and she had the best story. Oh. I didn't know anything but I'd already known that you were like a great speaker you must have been at the last W boss one maybe it was like in the summer I spoke at women's day oh okay last March it was definitely you she was talking about like she didn't oh a hundred percent she didn't I don't think there's any other but she was like really she was touched six months later about your story yeah 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 and then um so then my friend Hannah was there and uh then you did a interview with her not that long later I think I listened to it in the fall sometime yeah and I've listened to your podcast and I wanted to have you here today because I think that you have a cool story you have a cool journey and uh I don't know a ton about recovery coaching so yeah I'm excited to learn more yeah it's so I can tell and and um correct me if I'm wrong Based on your questions, which were so innocent and pure, okay. <laughs> that you have not been touched at all by addiction. Um, so I would say when I was in my 20s, I was like the fun drunk. I think it hindered me completely. Okay. <laughs> I think that I, um, like I went to university, I went to college, but like I served for 10 years because yeah. my priorities were like going out drinking. Yes, yes, yes. Um, here's a random story that I will share. Um, Because I've told other people because I've cut back on drinking severely since I had my oldest. Yeah. Um, So I have a lot of stomach issues. And I went to the doctor because I was like, I don't know what all these stomach issues are from. And he's like, well, how many drinks do you think you have a week? And I was like, hmm. And I told him like 30 to 35. And that seemed totally he probably fell off his fucking chair that i had sorry can i swear on here yeah is that fine okay i had a swollen foot once and he told me it was gout like he was like yeah i have gout and i was like oh okay but i'm telling you 30 to 35 did not seem like too much it seemed totally reasonable yeah so i was like well i go out tuesday wednesday thursday saturday friday like i probably have four drinks three shots like yep minimum yeah the 35 and that was all the time yeah I was the fun drunk, and I wanted to be the fun drunk. I think the standard for alcohol use disorder, I think, is like it's like four drinks a week, something like absolutely obscene. Like if- the number is so small, <laughs> and like if you look at that, like it's like literally everybody I know. Oh yeah, could qualify for alcohol use disorder. Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah, I went to the doctor um, like all the time now or not all the time. I go to the doctor now and they're like, how many drinks do you drink? And I say, I don't drink. Yeah, I would drink maybe three drinks a month. And I like one Friday night a month. Yeah, Never drink now. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, isn't that crazy that 30 to 35 seemed. Yeah. Like, where did my money go? Yeah. I was like literally serving, putting my money in my pocket, going to the bar, sweating my butt. Yeah. Money. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you worked in the industry that basically like that funnels you into that. And I was like, should I get another job? No, that would hit her on my party. It really, that was really like my goal. Yeah. Time. Yeah. I was the drunkest bride I've ever seen. I've never seen a bride drunker than me. Yeah. And like, I'd love I was, to see videos from your no, wedding. It was, was no <laughs> but like, I remember the next day being super embarrassed about it. Yeah. I don't, I remember being like, oh my God, I couldn't not drink for one night. Right. Yeah. Uh, I had kind of a similar, well, I was worried about having a similar experience at my wedding. I mean, I'm since divorced, but um, I was also smoking a lot of weed at the time. So I kind of made a pact and I like I told my friends, like, I don't want to get drunk. I'm just going to like do drugs all night, basically. And so I that was like the one night that I like kept it yeah. together. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, with respect to what my life looked like yeah. at the time. But yeah. Yeah. 
wow, 30 to 35. I would say, yeah, definitely. And then, um, then like it's, I struggled to get pregnant and I was like, well, you have to stop drinking. Yeah. Oh, so I did. Like, I've never had issues with like needing a drink. I, and I, I, that doesn't mean that I'm not that way. I wasn't a drunk then. I just feel like if someone was like, you have to go a week without drinking. I'm like, sure. Yeah. I can go a week without drinking. Yeah. I feel like someone tells me go a week without cheese and I struggle like the next day. I'm like, I need cheese. But drinking I, was never really. Yeah, I could not give up cheese either. Yeah, I know. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> like, um, But I struggled to get pregnant. So then I kind of stopped drinking then. And then um, I have had bad nights since, but nothing like I used to. Yeah. And I have a job now that you can't really do that. But yeah. Yeah. I also, I should say that I used to pride myself on being the fun drunk. Yes. Like, I was known as the fun drunk. People would be like, oh, Becky, she's so fun when she's drunk. Yeah. I, did I make friends? Mi- like, thousands of friends. Yeah. Of friends. Yeah. But uh, never progressed in my career. Never saved money. Yeah. Uh, lots of things that were, uh, like, at the time I didn't re- didn't prioritize that, and I wish I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's such an important part of your story and people's story is like there's there's certainly an illusion that comes with being the fun drunk. Yeah. And like, yeah, if I and I say this to people a lot is like if I peel back the layers of your life, that's like, OK, well, what do your relationships look like? What does your career look like? Where are your finances mm. going? And it's like, oh, no, it's it's actually getting kind of dark in here. Yeah. 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 That's funny. It's funny that you asked me that question Mm because I didn't know if I was going to share that or not. Um, I have that effect on people. You do. Also, if you cry today, that's fine. Okay. (laughs) Because I also have that effect on people. (laughs) I also grew up, I was thinking about this before I heard if I was going to mention it, but I also grew up with like a beer fridge. Like my parents had a beer fridge and had pop in there and juice boxes, but it was always full with beer. Yeah. And so I've always grown up just like beer has been a part of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My parents were um, a drink right after work. Yeah. And so when I moved out and, you know, started my little, I was a career woman when I was like 25 or whatever. But it was like, no, that's what happens. That's, it's not even, you don't even think about it. It's just like, yes, you get home and you have a drink. Yeah. I'm not a get home and I'm a drink person, but I'm like, if I'm going to get drunk, if I'm going to drink, I'm getting drunk. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not like a, just a one beer. No. Oh, that sounds horrible to me. I was like, I might as well have water. Am I not getting drunk? To- I'm driving. I'm not even gonna have one. Oh, dude. Boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I got sober, people would say that too. Like, uh, you can have one. You, what? You can't even have just one. And I'm, I'm literally always like, what is the point of one? You're not even catching a buzz after one. Like, and I'm not here for the flavor. Let's be honest. I'm not drinking boxed wine or whatever because. <laughs> You know, or like Coors, because I'm like, mm, I'm just like so into beer. <laughs> no, I'm like drinking for the effect. So, yeah, I'd rather have zero. Yeah. And then now I'm like, I've committed to a life where I'm not getting drunk anymore. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm not having any ever. Any. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's my story. I love that. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Can you share your story? Are you ready to live kindly, confidently, and ridiculously happy? Me too. I'm Sophia Lemon, and I host Ridiculously Happy People Cast. Once a week, I sit down with an awesome person I want to learn from, and we talk about how in the heck to balance life. Throw on your sweats and prepare to laugh, cry, and even cringe as we talk about all the bullshit that comes along with living ridiculously happy. Subscribe to Ridiculously Happy People Cast, and that's PPL Cast, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your podcasts, and get your shit together with us. There's so much of it. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, where do you give us like the cold notes? Um, I'm a retired party girl. But that's not true because you still party. I saw you. I karaoke on the weekend. Man, I party so hard. And that's like the such a fun realization that I had. Honestly, in my first year of sobriety, there was like I had a group of sober friends and there was karaoke in Owen Sound like every Wednesday. And we would go, and we were so rowdy at Jason's pub. Um, the, that was Thursday. Okay, okay. So sometimes we would do that on the dark side, yeah, and it was yeah. like I was so gross in there. But they had a stage, which yes. is so fun. Yes, exactly. Um, so Wednesdays it was like Jasmine's or something. It was like an upstairs patio, 
and it was outside. The Shays. Um, maybe, yes. I'm not super familiar with Owen Sound, despite having worked there for a thousand years, but it was, so we would do that. And that was like, I mean, I, I would have been like months sober. Yeah. And so like realizing that I'm still an absolute maniac. Yeah. Oh, love that for me. Love yeah. that. Um, so I guess I'm a, I should rebrand that. So I'm a retired self-harmer, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, just like everybody in the whole world started drinking at 14, loved it. And I have like a diary entry, which is so horrifying, but I'm so glad I like did that of like the first time I got drunk and I was like, everything was better and like I was better. And then I like had literally written like, I'm going to do this as often as possible. And I like, I guess made that like my life's mission. Yeah. Um, but I, I, similar to you, like certainly had the illusion of functioning. I went to university. Um, I had great jobs. Like I, for all intents and purposes, had it together unless you knew me. Right. And then you'd be like, that is the biggest disaster I've ever seen. Like absolute train wreck of a person. Mm -hmm. And not just while drinking, but in between drunks also, like emotional regulation, managing my finances, like none of it, none of it belonged to me. But people say like when you start drinking or drugging, you like arrest your development. Yeah. And so I was like a, you know, 20 something year old. Yeah. But inside I was 14 and, and everything that comes with being a teenager. Yeah. And it was. I left Toronto, moved up here with my then fiance. We He started working at Bruce Power. I started working at Bruce Power. And there was like a corporate event. And I got black. Out. They had an open bar. First of all, they had an open bar. Yes. <laughs> so obviously I got blackout because it was free. There was nothing really exceptional about that night. But the next day I woke up so embarrassed I called my boss, like, crying, basically, um, just to, like, apologize. And there truly was nothing ex exceptional about that night, except the next morning I, like, ran into someone who was also at this, like, corporate event. And he was like, there's something wrong. Like, something's wrong. And he, like, held my hand and he was so gentle. And it was, like, a total, total stranger. Yeah. Um, and I guess we had, like, partied the night before. And I did not remember it. And he was like, mm, you need to look into this. Yes. And I literally never drank again. I wanted to know, like, when you were like, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to stop drinking. Was it like ever again right away? Were you like, I'm never going to drink again? Or was it kind of like, I'm going to try it for six months. I'm going to try it for a year. It was neither of those. Really? It was just like an in the moment, like, I can't drink. I feel like I you know if my life was a car I like took the steering wheel and just was like Rrr! like I'm in this lane now yeah. and that's all I was thinking about was how do I fix myself it like stopped being about drinking or not drinking it was there's so much damage that I've done and there's so much that I'm upset about and angry about how do I fix that you know what I mean like the like I I I don't want to be like, oh, no, I never thought about drinking again. But it just, it more was like, I need to stop doing this to myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the Coles notes. No, it's, I, um, people used to like smile at me the next day and I'd be like, oh, and you'd have to like fake that you remember partying with that person hey, like, before. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. I remember I heard you say someday that like the embarrassment the next day is always so, so bad. So bad. Yeah. And I went to a work function. I'd been working at my old job like for three months and I hadn't drank with anybody. And we had a golf tournament and same thing. It was an open bar. And I was a mess. Yeah. I had like a salad for lunch. Oh, then no. I started drinking with all my, these people that I barely knew. And the next day I got to work because I was a server. Even if you drink, you go to work the next day. And I was like, I yeah. can't believe you're here. And I was like, if you drink the night before, you go to work the next day. Yeah. Like... And that's like drunk and alcoholic behavior. <laughs> like they, yes, they didn't see that. I I saw that as normal. Yes. Meanwhile, they're like the way you were last night. You can still function. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, like not really super well. Yeah. 
And like, so you could like, still I'm hear throwing up in the bathroom yeah. during my breaks. But like, you know, like Sir. you come here, you come to work the next day. You can't be out drinking if you can't come to work the next day. But and I remember thinking like then, like, I have to stop doing this. I'm not going to get the promotion at work if you're the drunkest one at the Christmas party. Is that what like motivated you? Was like the work? Mm. I'm definitely. I'm definitely working. Yeah. I'm obviously child motivated. Right. I don't want my children to see. I don't want my children to think that that's like normal behavior. Yeah. Like drinking at 14 didn't seem unreasonable to me. No, not at all. Yeah. And now growing up, I look at all these bad choices I made. And I also grew up in Lion's Head, which is smaller than Port Elgin. Oh, yeah. I'm the fun one. And everyone would be like, yeah, Becky's so fun when she drinks. Mm-hmm. And I don't want that for my children. Yeah. Yeah. At 14, looking back now, is so, so young. young. I had my first beer because I, I have a late birthday. So I was actually 13 because everyone else was 14 and grade nine. Yeah. And it was, and I remember it was a blue light and I drank, I was drinking a cream soda and a blue light. So I drink my blue light and then I chase it with cream soda. Oh my God. The like juxtaposition is like almost poetic. Like chasing a beer with a cream soda. It's just like, <laughs> yes, because you're a child and children love cream soda. I yeah. still love cream soda, but that is wow. Yeah. That's quite the image. How's your husband been with, like, what's his relationship with alcohol? If you want to share your husband's laundry, he's yeah. not here to defend yeah. himself. Um, my husband smokes a lot of weed. Yeah. He's always telling himself, I'll quit smoking, I'll quit smoking. He doesn't. No, like, People have such a hard time quitting weed. It's probably the most difficult one. Same with nicotine. Yeah. It's crazy. Like the, there's not necessarily a physical, um, a strong physical reaction to weed, but the psychological, like the habitual, also like the, the ritual of, you know, putting your weed in the grinder, grinding it, like all of that, that whole ritual, like people got hooked on the ritual. Man, Becky, still, if you give me like a small triangle piece of paper, I will spin that up for you. <laughs> and like, I haven't smoked weed. I mean, I I quit uh, drinking and smoking weed in the same week, um, but I was, I was still spin it up. Like it, like just that muscle memory, that yeah. ritual, like it's, it's wild, but no, it's so hard for people to quit smoking weed and they're like so irritable. They're oh, not sleeping. Like it. they're just disasters for like a while. <laughs> oh wait, that I, so I was on a group coaching call with the women in my program yesterday. And we were talking about like, there's a huge difference between uh, falling asleep and passing out mm-hmm. and like the first one is like you know there's this kind of relinquishing of control where you're just like let the substance do its thing and yeah. all you know pa- and then there's like the actual going to sleep which is like brushing your teeth getting in your jammas like yeah. that whole you know washing your face the serums the moisture yeah. <laughs> snuggling in like what show are you gonna watch yeah, like what yeah. else? and it's like a whole it's a whole thing and those two are so 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 different and like there was you know, a lot of us have this story of like passing out on the couch. Yeah. And like that, that's the passing out versus falling asleep, right? And you wake up on the couch and you're like, shit, fuck, what time is it? Like shuffle into bed. Like it's, they're very, very different. And the second one, falling asleep is so much more work. Yes. So much work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, oh, you can't sleep. Oh, your brain is racing. Guess what? You probably need to do some meditations. Get onto YouTube. Find a guided meditation. Oh, you need that person's voice. You're going to have to do a little bit more. Yeah. Like, Keep yeah, watching. maybe you have some anxiety stuff you need to yeah. work through during the day. And it's like this whole thing. But it's like, of course, people aren't sleeping. Yeah. Of course, you're not without no. something they're like don't forget people say no blue light two hours before bed you're like yeah i can't find my yeah i don't want to listen to yeah 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 no it's a whole it's not with any substance it's not just like well quit and now you get to live a normal life like no 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 no. there's like a billion you know even something as simple as going to sleep at night it's like there's a billion steps that precede you actually falling asleep. Yeah. How have you managed yourself and your thoughts and your emotions during the day? Have you had enough sunlight, physical activity? Have you eaten foods? Is your blood sugar at like the perfect levels? Like just, just all of it. Yeah. And that's one of the things um, 
I think you you had asked in the questions about like what's one of the common misconceptions and I was like oh that people just need to like just quit just stop mm-hmm. and it's like please don't oh because you're you're gonna be an absolute nightmare oh if yeah. you just quit and I think that I I um like with my husband he thinks the same thing I'll just quit don't then but then I feel like he feels guilty when he can't like you yeah. did it wrong you can't do cold turkey you have to come up with the steps and the plans yes oh man you have so much spare time when you quit it's crazy so much spare time <laughs> um yeah and like I, I know at the beginning for me I was just kind of like walking around like what do what do normal people do like yeah. I have no idea um but yeah no to, if if ye, and it sounds so weird for like a recovery coach to be like, okay. don't quit. Yeah. No, I, I know, but it's not realistic. You're setting yourself up for failure. I see that. And what do we do when we feel like failures? We abuse substance. Yes. yes. What a great reason for me to have a drink, right? To be like, oh, fuck it. You know, the case of the fuck it. It's like, yeah. well, I can't do it. Well, yeah, you're like literally setting up, setting yourself up for yeah. failure. So don't. You could try quitting and see how that goes. But if it's like not going very well, like just stop stopping just for a bit. Come home. Go. Go outside. Cool. Maybe that skip the next one. Maybe yeah. just skip the next one and then do the one before bed. OK. But if that if that one when you get home is essential, critical to his mental health and his functioning or yeah. whatever, that's the last one that we're going to eliminate. Okay. Or like the one before bed is like the last one we're going to eliminate. Just stop setting yourself up for failure it's not realistic and it like i think families have that expectation too where it's like you need well you need to quit well it's like no because are you prepared to handle someone that has like the mental capacity of a 14 year old mm. but is in like a 30 year old's body oh you're not okay then stop asking them to quit because it's yeah. fucking dumb <laughs> i love that i love that theory because i think that i thought yeah. you were because you said you just quit cold turkey so i, I did. thought that that was like also what we you're teaching but I like no I also I was I was going to 12-step meetings right multiple times a day oh because I had all this spare time true and I did not know what to do so before meetings like I would get home from work pace around my house get to the meeting early when the person got there that was like setting up the meeting and I would help them set up and I would be there in total of like two hours because yeah. the meetings are an hour and like and then I would just be like okay and then I would get home and it'd be after nine and it would be time to tackle some sort of bedtime yeah. sleeping yeah. situation yeah. played a lot of candy crush yeah right? <laughs> a lot of candy crush um yeah so I found something to fill my time like and and you know, I think a lot of people are like, eh, you know, but I'm not an alcoholic or whatever. It's like, cool, whatever. It's free. You can go there. You can learn about what you need to do to stay quit. Mm -hmm. And then you go home to your normal life and you're like a little a little more level than you were a few hours ago. Yeah. And they're free and they're accessible and they're everywhere and there's multiple meetings a day. So like what you got, if you have something better to do with your time, pitch me the idea. If but you don't. Like here in Port Algon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Between Port and South, there's meetings every day. Really? Yeah. I heard, I know that um, in one of the podcasts I was listening to from you, you said that, I think it, maybe it was you, um, Bruce Powerhead brings in a lot of money. Mm. And so we have these workers, and I don't want to generalize anybody, mm -hmm. but um, we have these workers that have all this money and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And this is where addictions start. And this might be like expensive addictions. It's a Coke town. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, I'll say it. Yeah. yeah. So is that why you think that the, there's all these, like in Owen Sound, we have all these meetings? Oh, yeah. Really? In Owen, Owen, I mean, Owen Sound is the booming metropolis of the area. So there's a million more meetings in Owen Sound. Yeah. And there's like Narcotics Anonymous meetings in Owen Sound, too. We had a few NA meetings in port back in the day, but they just, they kind of died off. But yeah, no one sound. NA is booming. Oh, yeah. Booming. Yeah. But it's recovery booming. It's not people who are using. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so funny. Like nobody knows. Nobody knows. 
it's like the recovery community. Yeah. I don't. Massive. It's massive. We're out there partying. Yeah. We're, you know, we're at the karaoke bars on stages. Like we're ev- we're everywhere. And I don't, I've lived here for, I don't know, 12 and a half years, something like that. 13 years, maybe. I don't know. I don't know the locals. I don't know people that are from here that grew up together and know everything about each other. And remember the time that she did this in high school, blah, blah, blah. I don't I don't know any of those people. And I love that. I <laughs> literally don't know anybody. Um, the people I do know is like anyone that's ever used drugs or had a drinking problem and anyone in recovery. Like I know everybody. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Like I love it because we're everywhere. Yeah. We're everywhere. Uh, th- you know what? I feel like I'm like yellow, but I feel like, yeah, I would have no idea if you didn't tell me. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw you singing karaoke, I was going to text you the questions or something. And I was yeah. like, oh, she's going to be hung over when she gets them. No, man. I know. I was in bed at 1130. And I was so like, yeah. I, well, first off, that made me think of my thinking. Like, so I just assume everybody's hung over the next day. Yeah. Um, And then I was like, that she lives such a cool life. She went and sang karaoke and wasn't even drinking. That is my goal. When I said I want to be the main character, I was like, I'm going to sing karaoke. But I've always assumed that there's drinking involved. Absolutely not. No. I would sound better if drinking wasn't involved. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. Am I going to win a round of applause? You're still, like, if you've got fun, Becky, in your identity, like, she's in there. And she's been laying dormant, it sounds like, for quite some time. (laughs) And she needs some airtime. Give, give her a mic. That's like part of my midlife crisis is I want to change my identity. Yeah. I didn't want to be the person that the fun drunk. So yeah, when you said identity, that is what I'm doing. Like I'm trying to change my identity. Yeah. But I'm also by changing identity, like I can't put myself in the situations where I become the fun drunk. It's like my idea. No. My plan. No. So like uh, we did a girls night. I drank but not as much as I used to and then when they were like let's go dancing I'm like well no because at least we're drinking yeah I'm trying to stop that and well and that like really. that's an important thing to know about yourself is like there's a story that you're telling yourself about dancing is that you can't do it unless you've been drinking yeah where does that come from yeah because why did you make up that random story <laughs> based on nothing do you suddenly lose all your rhythm like you know what I mean like do your limbs freeze up no, no, you can literally move your body. Yeah, without... that's true. I do it at home, but like, you... feel like if there's people around, I'm like, Ugh. beer, where's the beer? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so that's a thing that you kind of like have to sign off on is like you will feel every second of how humiliating mm-hmm. public <laughs> things like that can be, but it's uh, it wears off. It's yeah. nothing. I mean, it's nothing more than the humiliation of like a morning after i think yeah truly like what yeah like what's worse not knowing what you said and like uh, possibly offending somebody last night and like looking stupid in front of your people you barely knew or just like having fun she's like she's yeah. just having fun yeah and then yeah. driving home not having to ah. about a dr- cab ah the best Be- yeah the best. i stopped drinking um i i started reading two years ago and i feel like reading has changed my life significantly because I remember I went out drinking and the next I used to always wake up and start reading on my phone and I could like barely see the words. Yeah. And I was like, you know what I like more than drinking last night? Reading, waking up and reading. I can't even see the words. Yeah. So then the next time I was like, well, if I can drink, but I won't be able to read the, tomorrow morning. Yeah. Like that. The reading to me was like such a game changer. <laughs> yes. I never really thought about it till now. But like that was another thing. I was like, oh, like, so I didn't, don't even think I go out now because I'm like, I would rather stay at home and read. Love that for <laughs> you. But it is, it is those like small little things yeah. where you're like, I'd actually rather do this. So in order to do this, what do I need to do today to make sure that this happens yeah. tomorrow? I, yeah. Yeah. It's also impulse control. I have horrible impulse control. Yeah. That's like when I said, I just don't even, if someone's like, just have one. I'm like, I know the second it touches my lips. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have another one, another one, another one. So I'm just like, I'm just drinking water. Yeah. And I've definitely, I said I used to be the fun drunk. Now I'm like the sober one at the parties. Yeah. People know that because I'm like, I don't know. I yes. Just... Oh, my God. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your specific business. Do you yeah. do like all of Gray County or Grey Bruce Counties? Do you just do Songing Shores? I'm global, baby. Global. So you do a lot of online stuff? 
I only do online stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, I so I started in my first year um attempting to be purely online, mm-hmm. but my clients were for the for the majority local. Okay. So I was doing FaceTime, but they were local. Or um, if they really, really wanted in person, I would do in person. I was so burnt out. I was, um, there's something about trading like time for money. There's just not enough hours in the day. So I like accidentally had created this ceiling of income for myself limited to how many hours I actually had to work during the day. If I had to include travel time in there, okay, well, there's another hour that's gone. So if I have my daughter that day, well, then I can only actually work until three because I have to go get her from school and I can't work, you know. So I accidentally, because just I just didn't know better, had kind of pigeonholed myself into this like one type of life. And last year I was like, I was so unmotivated. So I'd also started with a niche and then expanded. And I thought like the more people that I can help, the better my business will be, the better, like the more money I'll make, whatever. Right. And it was actually like the total opposite. So I was like spread so thin. I was burnt out. Yeah. So unmotivated. Um, Just I'd really, yeah, last summer was really hard. I just really like had lost my passion. And I ended up hiring, getting into um, like a coaching program for health professionals in the online space. Okay. And the first thing that they forced me to do was niche down. Right. Niche down so hard that you think like there's only going to be like seven people in this whole world that I can help. So I niche down and now I only do group coaching with my specific niche, which is women who want to change their relationship with alcohol. Okay. So, and uh, I think maybe one of them is local. I think she had like followed me on um, Facebook previous, but like I have clients in the States, right? in Canada. Um, I only work with a couple clients one-on-one. Um, no, literally two. And the rest of them, so like right now I'm like I'm only working with women who want to change their relationship with alcohol. In group coaching. And it's a group coaching program. Yeah. I like that. It's the best. Yeah. Oh my God. Yesterday I got off my group coaching call, Becky. I felt high. Like it was so good. And then they started texting me after and they were like, that was the best. Like, thank you so much. And I'm like, I, this is better than any feeling ever. Like there's something about being in a group space that is like, so it's like electric when I finish this podcast like when mm-hmm. I finish podcasting I like am on a serious high yeah I'm on a huge high and I it's so much dopamine it's so I know and I I always say like like my husband knows when he comes home tonight that like I'm gonna be in the world's best mood yeah 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 and it's there's yeah. no like hangover there's no um well sometimes I'm like oh should I ask that or should I said something differently yes yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm, I, I know exactly what you're feeling yeah Oh, it's so good. And I and then you can like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 How do you find your clients? Like, how do they find you? I'd use Facebook ads. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a little bit of branding through my Instagram and through, I've got like two business pages now on mm-hmm. Facebook and I'm like fairly active on everything. Um, But I use Facebook ads to point people either to my website or my Facebook page right. so they can at least start creeping me. Yeah. There's actually one woman um, I enrolled last week who we got on like a discovery call and she was like, so I like found all your Facebook pages. I listened to a bunch of your podcasts yeah. and she was like sold. Like I didn't have to do any sort of like coaching on that call to be like you know this program might be the best like idea for you like she was just like look like let's go like I've seen what I needed to see you know let's do this and yeah so I'm like you know something is happening but I use I use Facebook ads which is where it's at well I was gonna say that's what I do for work too yeah I do Google and Facebook and Reddit 
if you Reddit like, might be a good one for you. What? Reddit? Yeah, maybe. Well, and that's what like this coaching company, I I will never not work with them, I think. Like they're so they're so good, but they just showed me they taught me how to like look at my metrics. And like if you can read your metrics, all the answers are there. Yeah, that's and then I'm like, okay, I have to adjust my messaging yeah. here and I've never yeah. seen your ads, so I feel like you must be getting it to the right people. There's times when I yeah. see ads, like I really like foods. So I see these charcuterie board ads and I click on them like, let's see. And yeah. they're like in Edmonton. I'm like, ah, yeah, they're Should I just message them and be like, ah, you're stop targeting the wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adjust your audience. Yeah. When you were talking about that, I was like, you must have it, your audience really niche too. then. I do. I use them. Uh, so I, I use a pretty narrow audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and then sometimes I do target to like my broad, um, my broader audience, but again just like the quality of leads like the you know they're not they're not my perfect client no. and i found like that the narrow one works the best oh and, absolutely yeah that's what we do you know sitting back and being like how does my perfect client think what is she doing what is she watching like yeah. all of that and i'm like okay real housewives yeah. travel like yeah all of it so yeah, that that's been really interesting. I I used Facebook ads in the past, but I don't I did not know what I was doing. Like and so to do it in a really direct way, so I'm like I know that they're out there. My mission is to like my responsibility is to like put my ad in front of their face so that whatever damage is being done, if they choose, they can literally stop it. Yeah, immediately. <laughs> yeah. I'm Lauren Best. And in my podcast, I have conversations with compelling creatives and answer your questions. I dive into what I've learned as a voice coach and performance poet and share why over 15 years of music leadership has shaped my collaborative approach. I reveal how I've reawakened my own creativity. Subscribe to my new show, Lauren's Best, wherever you get your podcasts. Join me on Substack for exclusive bonus content, laurenbest.substack.com. Hey, listen up. Tamara here from the Clean It Club podcast interrupting. Sorry, not sorry. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this podcast, you might just love the Clean It Club as well. We are all about deep cleaning our lives from the inside out, digging those skeletons out of our closets and letting go of what no longer serves us. So roll up your sleeves, dust off those life lessons, and join me and my friends as we learn how to navigate our way to a life with more love, more laughter, and maybe less piles of laundry. Find the Clean It Club podcast on Spotify. Let's talk. Okay, so I've. um, Can you give us like, kind of talk us through some effective coping mechanisms? So right, Cole's notes on that too. What's the question? The question is like, what? um, What's like the first step I a someone should take if Um, they want to change the first? I'm guessing reach out to you, but. What's like the well? It happens even before that. Um, is just to, just to like get real, basically. Yeah. Um. And the reality of it is, drinking and doing drugs is awesome, and they are super fun, and that's why we do them. And the real part comes in where you look at what is the cost of that fun. Yeah. Look at your relationships. Look at your finances. Look at your capacity to regulate your emotions. Look at your communication skills. How are all those things going? Yeah. Um, and then call me. Because it, when you get on the phone with me, I'm going to ask you all that stuff. And if you're like, no, 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 it's fine. No, 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 no. My, hu- like, my husband's good with it. You know, he doesn't get mad at me. And my spending is is fine. That I literally, and I've done this many times, be like, what do you need me for? Oh, yeah. A couple weeks ago, actually, I said to a woman, like, it honestly sounds like you need to do a bit more damage before you talk to me. And that made her get very real. And then she enrolled in the program, which is so funny. And now she's just like the light of my life. But to like to get to get real. Right. Because it's not the alcohol that's bad. It's not the drugs that are bad. They're great. Such a great time. We love those. (laughs) Um, It's everything that comes with it. And if you can't bring yourself to talk to it, talk about it, or 
if you can't bring yourself down to like a deeper level, then it doesn't sound like you're ready to do to change anything yet because you yeah. you know you don't know what you're walking away from because if everything's fine, it's fine, it's fine, then like okay, then go be fine, right. When you were talking earlier, uh, oh, when you were like, don't go for the, like, start with, skip the next one. Yes, yes, yes. So, like, just kind of start small. Yeah, sort of. So, like, yeah, maybe only have two beers after work instead of four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's a win. That is a huge milestone. Like, we celebrate those all the time with my clients. Like, that is actually a huge freaking win because last week you couldn't do that. Yeah. And then last night. You did it for the first time. Yeah. That's a big, big freaking deal. Um, is the goal always to become completely sober? Is the goal, like you said, just change through your relationship? Yeah. So um, I love abstinence. I'm very open about my own abstinence. Mm-hmm. I love it. Works for me. Would not change it. Um, but that's not everyone's goal. Um, some women, you know, some women maybe want to be abstinent while they're working with me and shift their relationship with not only alcohol but the my program is designed to change your relationship with yourself yeah so that you know if you're if you're having a feeling your first instinct isn't necessarily to have a drink it. about it yeah. yeah um so sorry i lost my train of thought what was the question um like is it always oh abstinence. Abstinence. yeah no so i'm i'm very just like very supportive of as long as you're not hurting yourself yeah and like the program's called the self-control solution so it's like if you can get to a space where you feel completely in control of whether or not you have a drink one drink whether or not you have a second drink completely you feel in control and it's not like a you know well you can't have one drink well I know if I'm gonna have one drink I'm having 17 so it's not that anymore you just you get to a space where you're like I'm literally tired of like hurting myself and feeling like shit about it yeah yeah and if you do that through abstinence great if you do that through moderation great whatever right yeah so uh one of the analogies you used when i listened to you the holistic goddess podcast was that you said um you have like an interesting take on when someone brings a bottle of wine yeah to a housewarming gift or housewarming party or something yeah and <laughs> maybe you want to elaborate. Do you want me to share? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I was going to say, you said something like, it's like giving them a thing of heroin. Yeah. Because that's how damaging alcohol can be. Yeah. And they're not different. But we've like, as a society, agreed that like heroin is gross and dirty and yeah. alcohol is classy and fancy. That's true. And for no reason. Yeah. Based on nothing. Um, and... Yeah. And like, I, I mean, I was even saying like Port's like a bit of a Coke town. Yeah. It's also a meth town. People love their stimulants and it just depends on honestly how much money you have. Um, but yeah, it, it there is no difference. With, you might as well just bring your brick of heroin and be like, congrats on your new house. Here's your brick of heroin and your new cactus. Um, the The only difference is that like the opiate might kill you that night. Right. Yes, I remember you saying that. That's it. Like we can we can use alcohol forever. We can use it forever. But so here here is here's the you know, here's a bottle of wine. Yeah. Maybe in thirty years you'll get, you know, cirrhosis. But like here it is anyway. Yeah. Or here's a brick of heroin. See you never. Like it like what is the difference? What is the difference? There isn't. We just have just all collectively silently decided that one's bad and one's okay. Maybe. But I thought that was an interesting take and I related to it. Like it alcohol kills you slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it I it's also like you didn't use any imagination. Everyone else brought brought, brought a bottle of wine. Come up just like kind of be like more imaginative. What else could you bring me? <laughs> bring like a bowl. Yeah. Or yeah, or like a plant. Like I love plants. Yeah. Some picture frame. Yeah. Yeah. I understand like you don't want to show up empty handed, but you don't have to like and you never know what that person's gone through. Yeah. Their family history. Like just don't. But yeah. Um I do want to know like why you started your own business. Like you were working at Bruce Power. 
what drew you to start your own business doing recovery coaching? Oh, I was working at Bruce Power so long ago. So I've had a whole life oh, okay. since Bruce Power. Yeah. Um, I got sober when I was working at Bruce Power. I went back to school for addictions um, and started working in that industry. And then I was working for the hospital. Okay. Um, in Owen Sound for like seven or eight years. Um in the addictions space and it, I had the same experience with Bruce Power. It was very much like square peg round hole. Like I do not belong in any sort of working for someone corporate situation. Yeah. And um, I got very burnt out, not by my clients. I I truly think I wasn't spending enough time with the clients that like that is what energized me and that is what like I was really good at and that's what I could do with my eyes closed sick if I had to. Like that part was really easy for me. It was the stuff outside of it. Like um all the bureaucratic all 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 of that stuff. Plus there was also a ceiling on how much money I could right. make. And so I was living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I own a home. I own my car. I have a child. Like, yeah. I was just burning through my savings. Um, and I'd been toying with taking some time off to, like, like take a mental health leave because I was really – I was having really bad panic attacks all the time. Like, suddenly I would just be crying oh. in the world, out in public. Yeah, yeah. And it got to a point in the last month before I left, I was crying on my way to work and on my way – home from work like it was bad bad yeah. and um and so I was like I'd kind of been postponing making a doctor's appointment to just get like a doctor's note just to take some time off to like really reevaluate like what it is I thought I was doing yeah and I was driving to work one day crying it was really slushy out we'd had like a big snowfall two years ago and it was melting and it was slushy and like out of nowhere the hand of the universe yep flicked my car off the road and it like spun around and ditched my car literally never went back to work again like it was like i made a doctor's appointment it was wild becky yeah like i made a doctor's appointment i got in immediately she was like yeah you need some time off took some time off i got on an antidepressant slash anti-anxiety med took that for a while took that for a year just weaned myself off I tapered off for four months and it wasn't even like a high dosage um but I ditched my car I got home that day I crawled into bed and I like built my website and I was like I just knew like something yeah this was too freaking weird something is happening yeah and I need to be prepared for it and yeah I was off work for like a couple months I spent probably six weeks on my couch like I was that burnt out. Um, I was taking care of my daughter, but I was not taking care of myself. Like I, I had no energy. It felt like I'd hit a brick wall. And, but still, building a website doesn't take a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did it, and that's how I started my business. No, I love it. I feel okay. First off, I did get goosebumps when you said that. One of my things is like I think the universe talks to you. And I think like it whispers. Yeah. And if you don't listen, it's screaming. And so, oh, so when you said that, I was like, I, this is what I'm trying to tell people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And even my car was in that ditch for so long before a tow truck could come out. And a woman, I'd been saying, no, I'm good to so many people driving by. And this one woman was relentless and yeah. got out of her car and was like, girl, get in my car. It is freezing out here. She's like, I have coffee and I have cigarettes. And I was sm a smoker at yeah. the time. And I was like, that's literally all I've been doing. And so I got in her car and I'm like, you know, what's your story or whatever? She's like, I just quit my job. I was on a mental health leave for a year. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, this is the person that was sent to me right now. And so it was just too weird for me to be like, yeah, her name was Lori. We still stay in touch. Um, but yeah, she was a godsend. And so that day I was like, this is all I can't, yeah. I can't keep ignoring it because it literally just shot me off the road. So it's time to do something different. I love that. I know. Um, I like to ask if you give specific advice 
and I love that. Like, I I like to ask like, what's a small business hack? But maybe your business like just start a website. Just get the that in that it. yes. Well, yeah. and I read that question that was literally my answer was just build a website. Whatever happens start. to it, whatever, just build it. GoDaddy name cheap. Buy a domain name. Buy your first name, last name as a domain. Like it doesn't matter. They're not expensive. Just do it. Just do that. Just buy a domain name. That go to you know a hosting. Yeah. You Shopify can host you. Whatever. Like there's a million, and just um just build it out. Just why not? Yeah. Just start there. Love it. Yeah. I don't know if I want to cover anything else. Is there is there anything you want to talk about that I kind of missed? Um, there was one question about how can families best support yeah sure yes and i have like i think a very controversial opinion okay. about that as i do um like bringing heroin to a housewarming yeah. party <laughs> um but the thing that people miss is that like everyone has to stay in their own lane so if you best want to support your family member that's going through substance use issues the best thing you can do is like leave them the hell alone. Stay in your lane. Okay. And they stay in their lane. And though you can never, you're never allowed to cross into each other's lanes and you can drive like parallel next to each other, but leave them the hell alone. Is this like in addiction recovery or is this an addiction? All of it. Okay. All of it. Yeah. Um, I understand how like, crazy it can be to love someone that's got substance use stuff um but it is not your problem your problem is getting yourself help getting yourself to therapy getting yourself to um support groups like Al-Anon that are like literally just for families um your uh problem is you probably suck at boundaries and you are being manipulated because we are yeah. so good at that um you are being manipulated you have no boundaries you you might suck at communicating like that's all that's all your lane stuff that you yeah. need to sort through the um your family member or your loved one has their own completely separate path you can ask about it you can express interest you can be like you know that's i'm just you seem to be looking really healthy lately okay. how are you feeling like hope you're feeling okay whatever but to be like, I'm making you a doctor's appointment. Right. I'm driving you there. Let me look at your bank statements. Get the fuck out of here. Okay. Stay in your damn lane. Because yeah. that that is like, if you want to push someone away, and if you want to completely forget about yourself in the process and become obsessed with someone else's yeah. life, you're basically doing what like the addict is doing, except your drug of choice is this it's person. This person. <laughs> yeah. I can see that for sure. Yeah. Like, and... I just see that happening so often where like family members will come to me and be like, well, how do I get them to change? And I'm like, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but like, where are the parts where you need to change? And they're, yeah. they're like, go fuck yourself. Kate. I was going to say, well, yeah. I'm not like, I feel like <laughs> listening to you say that, I was like, I could do that. Like, I feel like if a friend of mine, I could do that. But then I think like, what if my children were like the addicts? I'd be like, that's the tough that's, thing. Like, that's so tough. Like, it may, maybe it makes me cry, cry but yeah, like, yeah, that is yeah. your children. No, I, I think about that. I think about that too. And like, I've obviously worked with a lot of people that have children that are addicts. And like you, the the number one thing is boundaries, like in a very loving way. Um, You know, I know that you're using regularly. You can't use in the house. If you step outside, maybe you're okay with that. Maybe not. Um. You can't use anywhere near the house, but if you're already under the influence, it's okay for you to come home. Yeah. But, you know, ple like the communal space is not for people that are under the influence, you know, keep that private or whatever. Like, like literally you have to figure out what your boundaries are that makes sense to you, you know? And if it's like your spouse, then like, okay, after three drinks, I'm going to take the kids and we're going to go to my mom's or, or whatever. But like you... That all is based on you and your comfort level. And and you have to work so freaking hard to maintain your comfort level. But it's not about, well, you need to change what you're doing because I'm uncomfortable. 
like, well, your discomfort is your your responsibility. So figure it out. And if it means staying with your parents for a while or, you know, like, or with your kids to be like, well, you can't use here, but I understand that you do live here and this is also your space. So like, okay, what, what are you comfortable with? In the garage and then go right to, you know, the privacy of your bedroom or like what, like figure it out. But you can't just be like, well, you need to quit because that's not a thing. It also, like hearing that makes me think like if they do have a problem, like they know that you'll respect them when you they talk to you too. So yeah. being like, well, I told you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. No, everyone needs to like maintain their dignity. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you money, but I'll give you food. Yeah. That's a great boundary. Right. So much love. Yeah. I'll feed you. Yeah. Oh, I love that's my that's my uh love language. Love language. Yeah. Feeding people. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. That was like the one thing that I was like, oh God, this is like so many people think like you have to figure out a way to control this other person. And it's like, no, you just you have to figure out a way to control yourself so you don't get swept away. And we are hurricanes. Yeah. Like in active use, I and still sometimes I'm guilty of it as like I will take down anyone that's near me. Like I'm like, it's it's me, 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 me. It's my problems. My problems are your problems. You solve my problems now. Thank you. I'll just be hanging out here. Um, you can't let that happen. You have to be like, you have to be a strong, firm, firmly rooted tree in the middle of a hurricane. Okay. Well, what is it? Okay. I always ask. You're on death row. This is my like little oh, yes. question. You're a fun question. You're on death row and you only get one meal left. What's your last meal? Something my mom makes. She'll know what it is. Okay. Just like mom's cooking. I'm the same. Yeah. People, when I'm always like, my dad used to make these West, or I know what mine is, but my dad used to make these Western sandwiches. And I'd always felt like we must have had great nights after I ate them or something. Yeah. It just, so that's what I'd want. Like just. Make me feel like a big hug again. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kinga, thank you. How thank you. I'll find you in your services. I'm everywhere. Just Google me. No. <laughs> um, my website is recoveringfromeverything.com and all of my socials and podcasts are on there. So just go there. Yeah. List of services is on there. Random videos are on there. I it's love all, that. It's all there. Recovering your, from everything. Yeah. Your podcast, Recovering from Everything. Yes. Yeah. And you're global. I'm global. So my uh, Romanian listeners, they can contact you too. I have a under 1% following. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of under 1% things, but all right. Thank you.